Hi, everybody. My name is Haley from Pro Writing Aid. Thank you guys so much for joining another session for the Pro Writing Aid series for writers. My guests today are Anne Hawley and Rochelle Ramirez. Anne has produced and co-hosted 115 episodes of the Story Grid Editor Roundtable podcast, and she trained under Sean Coyne of Story Grid. She has five decades of writing experience and has been a developmental editor since 2015, providing objective, substantive feedback so writers can write better stories and change the world. She's also the author of the historical love story, Restraint. Rochelle also trained under Sean Coyne of StoryGrid and has edited award-winning and best-selling fiction and nonfiction. She's committed to offering actionable editorial assistance for writers in all phases of their careers. Rochelle attended the School of the Art Institute of Chicago's Master's in Creative Writing program and has an MA in Psychology from Goddard College. She is the author of An Introduction to Genre. To genre excuse me. We are so excited to have you guys both here, Rochelle and Anne. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you and you can take it away. Great, thank you. I will start sharing my screen here like a real pro. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome to the five essentials of scene. Um, my name is Anne Hawley, and uh, you've got a pretty good introduction to me there. Thank you very much, Haley. It's great to be here, and it's great to see so many the people are still filtering in, so many people interested in honing your scene work skills. I came to this knowledge myself through sort of a long path that involved a degree in literature and about a million writing workshops and critique groups and that sort of thing. And I ended up writing a 230,000 word novel, the one referenced there called Restraint, that needed cutting. It, believe me, it didn't end up that long. Um, my quest to cut it down is what led me to the StoryGrid University where I did become a developmental editor. And I now do specialize in editing literary and historical fiction and also indie screenplays. I did finally end up cutting 100,000 of those 230,000 words from my sweeping saga of love, mostly by targeting whole scenes that did not work. So good working scenes are what we're going to be talking about today. And I will pass the mic and then we'll get started. Hey, I'm Rochelle Ramirez and I am a writer and certified editor specializing in narrative nonfiction which means stories like memoirs, self-help, and business books, and cultural documentaries. I help writers entertain their audiences and create positive social change, because we can do both. Before we start, I'd like to let you know that we're doing the Q&A at the end, and please go ahead and start typing, if you can, some questions into the Q&A specific box there at the bottom, and we'll answer as many questions as we can in the last 15 minutes. Then you can also visit storypath.me slash storypath to get your free copy of the guide of the seven essential story types that'll help you finish a professional working draft of your story. So why in the world are we here today? Why should we be learning about writing good scenes? We suspect it's because you might need a little bit of help. You might want a little bit of help. You may be struggling with a number of challenges that a good scene structure can solve a good example is pacing problems. Also, good scenes can improve audience, audience interest. No more slow, boring, or repetitive segments with tangents or excess exposition. Good working scenes will improve your narrative drive, create audience tension and character empathy that will glue audiences to your story. This is why scene level work is often the solution when your plot is not advancing, because you're building your plot scene by scene and mastering scene work is critical for completing a publish worthy story. We've got you covered in this webinar, you're going to learn the five elements every working scene requires, how to spot the elements in a good working scene, how to diagnose scenes that don't seem to be working and how to make your scenes work. So let me hand this to Ann Holly so we can get moving. Okay, well, thanks, Rochelle. First, I'm going to quickly go over the five essential elements of scene that every scene and every story needs in order to work. But don't worry, we'll come back to them and you'll have three chances to practice them and really begin to internalize them. The practice coming up is going to consist of finding these five essential elements in a short story, a very short story, about going to the beach. And then after that, you'll analyze a scene from a popular and well-written movie. 
And finally, we're going to examine a written scene from a popular children's book. Okay, so here are the five essential elements of scene. You need an inciting incident, complications leading to a turning point, a crisis, a climax, and a resolution. Let's take these one by one. The first essential element of every scene is an inciting incident. This is an event that disturbs the character's status quo. Something has to happen to disturb the character from whatever they were doing before. It causes the character to want something and makes them set out towards that goal. Now, the inciting incident can be intentional, that's it's caused by words or actions of another character, or it can be coincidental, for example, an act of nature or a pure happenstance or coincidence. Next, you need complications that lead to a turning point. At least one complication has to lie in the path between the character and what the inciting incident made them set out towards. If you have more than one complication, the complications need to mount or progress until they force the character into a choice that makes them turn or change direction. And that is the turning point. When in doubt, read or listen or watch with your body as Christopher Vogler talks about in the writer's journey. The turning point is usually the part of the scene where you feel it the most strongly. The minimum number of complications in a scene is one. That is the complication is the turning point and we'll see an example of that. Uh, three complications are usually plenty. That's sort of a rule of thumb. The turning point pushes the character to a crisis. This is a choice that they have to make. The options that they have to choose between both must be consequential and equally weighted. You should be able to state the crisis as a question that is, has an either or side to it. And we'll see plenty of examples. And often the crisis, usually in fact, the crisis is not written out or spoken. It's in subtext and derived from earlier points, points in the scene. The choice that the character faces can't be a no-brainer such as, do you want cake or do you want death? Well done, you want cake. Um, and it can't be frictionless or inconsequential such as, do you want chocolate cake or do you want vanilla cake? That, that doesn't mean anything. The dilemma has to have no ideal answer. The character now cannot have what they set out for and they now have to choose either the slightly lesser of two evils or the slightly better of two goods neither of which was exactly what they had in mind. So the crisis sets up a question and the climax answers it. The climax is the answer to the character, the, excuse me, the crisis question, and it is which one the character chooses. It's the choice between the conflicting op options. And the climax is shown in the scene by characters, actions, or words. Ideally, it's not delivered in exposition. Finally, there's a resolution, and that is the action that proceeds from the climax decision, what happens after that. And it generally leads into the next scene, unless it happens to be the final scene in your story. It, typically, the resolution is pretty short or even implied, but it also may be a longish, what uh, they call sequel to the scene. Uh, we're gonna see all short, um, very short resolutions in, uh, in our studies here today. To analyze a scene well, you also need to be able to detect two things and to write a scene well, you also be, you must have these two things. There has to be an event, something has to happen. This is a literal action that takes place on the page to move the character from one state to the other. And the character does have to change from one state to another. You have to be able to identify that they went from A to B. If you have no event, you don't have a scene. If the character doesn't change in the course of the scene, change state in the course of the scene, you don't have a scene. Okay, so let's go on to our first exercise. It's a little story, very simple little story that I made up in this time of COVID <laughs> about going down to the beach for a day, which I can't do right now. Here's the story. It's your first day off in three weeks and you wake up to this great song, Walk on the Ocean by Toad the Wet Sprocket personal favorite of mine. It gets you thinking, you know, it's been a while since I've seen the ocean. I think I will drive down to the coast today. Maybe get a late breakfast at the Pig and Pancake in Cannon Beach. Because there's nothing better than the Pig and Pancake in Cannon Beach. So you get in your car and you head out west from Portland. We're in Portland, so we're talking Portland here. 
But you notice your gas gauge is pointing towards E. So you have to stop at the gas station. And it's going to be another half hour before you finally get on the road from that. But as you head through town, you discover to your dismay that traffic is really extraordinarily heavy. And it looks like breakfast is kind of going to be more like lunch by the time you get there. You finally get moving again, but when you get out on the highway, you discover that Highway 26 has just been closed due to, let's say, a massive accident. Now, you could cut over to Highway 6, but Highway 6 won't take you to Cannon Beach. It only goes to Oceanside, and it's not the town you wanted to go to. There's no pig and pancake in Oceanside, but you'll at least get some fresh ocean air. Or you could turn around and try for Cannon Beach another day, maybe plan a little better, even though you might not be in that same magical mood that the song uh, set off, and who knows when you're gonna get another day off. So you take the cutoff to Highway 6 and you go to Oceanside. To your surprise, you discover that it's almost as beautiful as Cannon Beach, but with fewer people. And hey, Rosanna's Cafe may not be the pig and pancake, but she serves a excuse me, she serves a very nice crab cake lunch. So you enjoy your lunch and a nice long walk on the very uncrowded beach, and you head back to town refreshed and feeling like maybe you can face your work the next day. And I totally forgot to show you the picture of Oceanside, which is a very lovely and uncrowded beach. So let's break it down. In the chat box, um, let me know what you think the story event was. And I'm gonna just tell you, but you can go ahead and put some ideas in here. Essentially, all that happens in this little story is you, the character, drive down to the coast for a day. That's an event. And the state change within you, the character, is that you needed a refreshing day or a break at the beach and you ended up having one, you ended up satisfied. So we might say that the change of state was from unsatisfied to satisfied. Or you might say discontent to happy, something like that, a change of state. So let's have a look at the five essential elements of the scene. What do you think was the inciting incident? Now I'd really like to see some uh, suggestions or ideas in the, in the chat. We have the song, the song, <laughs> the song. <laughs> Yeah, it's a song. It's a song about the ocean that triggers your desire to drive to the coast. And this is what we call a coincidental inciting incident, it's pure happenstance. You had no control over it and nobody particularly caused it to happen. All right, let's talk about the complications leading to the turning point. So all the complications and the turning point, what do you think they were? Okay, starting to say, wow, people are <laughs> really on this. We're getting some great answers, yeah, okay. No gas in traffic, empty tank, empty gas tank, traffic, traffic jam. Yeah. Crowded and roads, needing gas. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Turning point, anybody? Closed highway. Thank you. Okay, there we go. So needing gas and heavy traffic. I saw someone mention that the desire to go to the coast is a complication. I would say no, that's just the response to the inciting incident. Um, so needing gas and heavy traffic were um, the, the complications. And... Um, the, the reason that it's important to have these is that if it had been clear sailing from just leaving to getting all the way to Cannon Beach, we would still be waiting for the story to start. It hasn't started yet. When things get in the way, that's when the story starts. Um, and notice that the complications escalate. Needing gas is like an every, it's a, you know, you might not have been planning for it, but it's an everyday sort of occurrence, nothing very big. Heavy traffic, also fairly common, but this was, this was unexpected heavy traffic. But the final complication, the turning point is the highway is closed. It's insurmountable. You cannot get to Cannon Beach. That highway is closed. Um, and that prevents you from getting where you want to go. You are forced into the crisis. A crisis decision. Anyone want to take a stab at the crisis question? And remember, it's a two-sided question. It's either this, but not that, or the other thing, but not something else, right? Okay, so we're getting go to Oceanside, home or Ocean Shores, which road, go to the other beach or turn around and go home. 
stay home or go to the beach. Yeah. Everybody is sort of, you're getting, you're getting the, the gist of it here. That's, that's the choice between two things. But I want to point out something very important about the crisis question when you're analyzing your own scenes. It's got two pieces to it. It's turn around and go home disappointed and disappointed and hope for better luck some other day. So there's a bad and a good in that. Or take the other road, but wind up where you weren't inspired to go. So there's a little bad and a little good in that. And you want to look for those equally weighted goods and bads in your crisis question. Okay, so the climax is the answer to the crisis question. What do you think the climax of this little scene is? Choose to go on. The ocean side was amazing. Love the beach and restaurant is great. Do I want to take the alternative? The beach okay. is almost as good. Well, yeah. The, do I want to take the, the Remember, the crisis is a question and the climax is the answer. Do I turn around and go home and wait for a better day or lo and lose the inspiration? Or do I go to the beach I don't want to go to but have a decent day at the beach? Right? What's the answer? You choose to take the other road. You give up Cannon Beach and you accept Oceanside, basically the unfamiliar beach town. Now I saw a lot of people mentioning what are really the resolution in the in the scene. So let's go on to that. We we had um, uh, well, go ahead. Pe people keep you. Those of you who put in something about the beach town and the restaurant, you were in the resolution there. Yeah satisfied by the similar beauty of Oceanside and Cannon Beach. The day turned out to be good. Yes, those are all, the resolution can be a little bit nebulous. Um, you enjoy a day at the coast after all, and then you head home the end. That, that's the, pretty much the resolution. Um, so our next practice is going to be with a uh, little short scene from early in the film, Coco. It's a very well-written movie and uh, it's a lot of fun. So I am going to check my sound on is here. Let me stop share for just a second and double check that I turned the sound on. Pretty hard to share a scene without that. Okay, we're good. All right. Okay, good, good scene. This is early in the story. It's a very um, consequential scene for Miguel, the protagonist. The story event is basically a photograph, an old photograph, uh, the dog knocks it down, the old photograph makes Miguel decide that he can become a musician or realize that he could become a musician. His change of state is extremely consequential in the story. He goes from being embedded in his family to alienated from his family. For anyone that's a big deal, for a little boy that's a huge deal. So let's go through the five um, essential elements of the scene. What do you think was the inciting incident? Finding a photo, the picture, finding the photo. Yeah, we all pretty much agree guitar on that Guitar broken, one. the picture. Uh, okay, whoa, well, okay. <laughs> the guitar broken, that's an interesting one. We'll get to that. Um, just Discovery a felt of guitar. It yeah, okay. Um, the inciting incident, I have the dog knocks the photo off the ofrenda, revealing the new information to Miguel. Um, that would be a coincidental inciting incident. The dog is kind of like a force of nature. He didn't do it on purpose. Okay. So there, this, is, this has quite a few complications in it. So let's go ahead and list some of the complications leading up to the turning point. Somebody's seen this movie a lot. They know the names of the characters in the photograph. That's Imelda, Coco, and Hector. That's good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Complications. Yeah, the family is against the music. Uh, somebody says, great grandpa left his family, he's not a hero. Complication, the family doesn't know, doesn't wanna know, forbid him to follow that. That family is against everything, family and culture. Yeah, <laughs> the complications are things that are happening in the scene. Um, someone mentioning that grandpa was a was a bad guy after all is sort of that was part of the discovery but the com remember the complication is what stands between the desire that was incited by Miguel discovering the photograph and his the thing that he wants which is I want to go be a musician in the in the plaza so 
I think one of the complications, you can argue with this, but one of the complications is that Miguel thinks that Ernesto is his ancestor. If you haven't seen the whole movie, this won't make much sense, but that is a lie. That is a, that's not true. He discovers an untruth, so that's gonna get in his way um, later, but it drives him forward now. The family in one way or another shuts down his enthusiasm uh, because they're against music. They're stopping him from going to uh, to, to play his music. And the grandmother says, I will not allow it. And the father says, end of, end of discussion. And the turning point, some people have already gotten there, <laughs> breaking the guitar. Right. Yeah. And that I want to say is the, one of the reasons I chose this scene is because you feel that in your body and your stomach. It's just like, oh my God, she broke the guitar. And you feel what probably Miguel must be feeling, sort of shocked. Yeah, gut punch, exactly. Yeah, very mm -hmm. strong stuff. Okay, so this breaking of the guitar and the forbidding of music to Miguel forces him into making a difficult and consequential decision. What do you, how would you term that crisis? Should he listen to his family and not play music or leave his family and join the talent show? Honey, Ali, that is perfect. <laughs> yeah, you got the two-sided question. Very good. Should he obey and keep the peace? These are my wording here. Obey and keep the peace with his family, um, but give up his music or disobey, jeopardize his family relationships, but keep his music. Very consequential, equally weighted, a difficult decision. The answer to the crisis question is the climax. What decision does he make? What does he decide to do? He leaves, running away for the talent show. Yep. I don't want to be in this family. He chooses music over family. Remember, going back to the story event and the character's change of state, the character changes from being embedded in his family, the grandma kissing him and everybody loving on him, to being completely alienated from his family, by his, partly by his choice, uh, the choice that they sort of force him into. And the resolution? He can have his music, talent show, question mark. He left his familia. Yeah. Goes to the talent show. Yeah, he runs off to the plaza. And the last thing we see in the scene is the poster saying, come and you know, play music in the, at the talent show. So that is the resolution of the scene in Coco. So now we want to look at a story that is written because most of us, I think here are probably working on written stories and many of us are novelists and not filmmakers. So it's important to examine scenes that are in text that are, that are in writing. Now we didn't want to take the time for a long, typical adult novel scene, which can run up to, you know, 2000 words. Uh, so Rochelle has chosen a solid scene from a children's book and it's very short. So I'm going to turn the mic over to her now and let her take you through that step by step. Rochelle? All right, this is the opening scene from That Rabbit Belongs to Emily Brown. Once upon a time, there was a little girl called Emily Brown and an old gray stuffed rabbit called Stanley. One day, Emily Brown and Stanley were launching themselves into outer space to look for alien life forms when there was a rat-a-tat-tat at the kitchen door. It was the chief footman to the queen. He said, the queen has very kindly noticed your rabbit. She would like to have that bunny wunny. In return, she offers a brand new golden teddy bear. Emily Brown looked at the queen's teddy bear. It was stiff and new and gold and horrible. It had staring eyes and no smile at all. No, thank you, said Emily Brown. This rabbit is not for sale and his name is not Bunny Wunny, it's Stanley. And Emily Brown politely shut the door behind him. That's the end of the scene. So what's the story event in this scene? Essentially what's happening? What forces Emily to change? How does Emily's state, how does Emily's state change from the beginning to the end of the scene? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna go ahead and answer that, that the primary change here is uninformed to informed. The queen wants Stanley, but it's not obvious yet that there's a threat to Emily. What do you think the inciting incident is? Can you put that in the chat? 
Anne, can you read that for me? Yeah, uh, the disrespect Stanley received. Uh, she does not want to quit her rabbit. The offer from the queen, rat a tat tat. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So Emily's status quo of life is interrupted when the footman offers to trade her bunny for a bear. Intentional caused by character action, right? What about the complication leading to the turning point? The answers are not pouring in as quickly on this one. <laughs> not interested in a swap, the golden bear, Emily's hatred for the bear. Uh, the offered bear looks horrible. Emily doesn't accept the offer. Lots of variations here. Yeah, because he is horrible. In this scene, there's uh, this is, maybe this is the, comp the tr trouble. In this scene, there's only one complication, and it is the turning point. The stranger, the queen's footman, informs Emily that the queen wants Stanley and offers a, hair, a horrible new bear in exchange. Right? So what do you think Emily's crisis question is? What must she decide here? Honey Ali K is doing a really good job here. <laughs> Refuse the bear and keep her bunny or take the bear and lose her Stanley. She exactly. may have to swap, trade or not. She does not right. want to give her bunny. Exactly. Does, Emily, does she risk upsetting the queen and the footman by refusing to trade Stanley for the bear? Or does she appease the queen, accept the horrible bear and lose her precious playmate, right? So what do you think the climax of the scene is? What was Emily's decision as demonstrated in her action? Well, she refuses. She was mad that Stanley was called Bunny Wani. She shuts the door, refuses the queen's offer, says no, refusal, no thank you. She keeps right. her bunny. Right, the climax of the scene is that Emily refuses to trade Stanley and sends the footman away, right? Okay, go. so what do you think the resolution is, the result of her action in the climax? Politely shuts the door, closes the door on the footman, politely shuts the door and stays happy with her bunny. That rabbit belongs to Emily Brown. <laughs> Gets to keep her bunny, keeps Stanley. Right. So the shutting the door was the climax. That was the action that showed the decision. The resolution then was Emily will keep Stanley for now and they're free to go back to their game. Right. Okay. You guys are getting the hang of this. Good work. Good work. You, go you guys, you've got this. So let's do a quick, <laughs> uh, let's do a quick review of what you've learned with us. You now know the five things every scene needs. You have a way to evaluate your scenes and other people's. They may be not like that. <laughs> you have Oh, they'll a love it. It's so valuable. <laughs> Depends on who you're working with, right? Yep. Okay, you may have a means, uh, okay, you now have a means of pinpointing what's wrong with a scene that doesn't seem to work. That's really helpful for you and your scenes. And you have the tools to make precision repairs so that every scene works. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but there's more. Before we go to the Q&A, we really wanted to cover some of the common scene mistakes we see with our editing, cl editing clients because this seems to bring the idea home a little bit better than, oh, this is great, this is great, this is great. So let's talk about some of the mistakes that, that we've seen with our clients and that we ourselves have made, myself especially. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so okay, so some of the mistakes are there's no clear inciting incident and the character's reason for entering the action of the scene is unclear. So waking up and starting the day is the bare minimum here of an inciting incident. Thinking is not. No matter what they're thinking about, thinking is not. There could be an irrelevant inciting incident in which the reason for the incident is unrelated to the story. So uh, an example, if it's say a crime story, let's say um, the inciting incident is a chance encounter with an attractive stranger who will turn out to be the love of the character's life, but it's a crime story. So you're writing the wrong kind of story here, right? This also happens with flashbacks as well as um, for example, a character's trying to solve a crime, but then stops to remember how her father used to walk her to school and hold her hand. Uh, unless that memory impacts solving the crime, it's irrelevant to the story. Also, just remembering something is typically not a good inciting incident. Yeah. And not usually the best piece of your scene, depends. 
Uh, okay, so another mistake is that complications can fail to escalate. We see this a lot. The situation doesn't continue to get worse for the character. We call these bobbing boats. For instance, a kidnapped character is shoved into a van and then unties his hands and then he's knocked out and then uh, he recovers and he finds his phone down, up, down, up, down, up. Sequence your complications so they go up, up, up and they get worse and worse and worse for your character. Right? Often we see too many complications. This was my challenge initially, one of them, only one of them. <laughs> we, if you have too many complications before the turning point, two is usually plenty, three is really pushing it. And really the only place for any more than three is slapstick comedy or maybe a battle scene. Some other common scene mistakes are someone other than the scene's principal character makes the crisis decision. I did this for my opening scene of my novel. Now, the scene's principal character might be your protagonist, but could also be another point of view character, including your antagonist. But regardless of which character is making the choice, the choice needs to be relevant to your protagonist. Another mistake, the crisis choice is too obvious or has low stakes. This is when the choices between, like Anne mentioned before, cake and death, duh, or between cake and pie. Another mistake, the crisis choice is unrelated to the overall story arc. For instance, the character must choose between Highway 26 and Highway 6, but the drive to the coast doesn't even forward the story, right? Okay. Mistakes and scenes might also look like no clear turning point. This is a Whoops. major problem because it means that nothing has stood in the way of the character's desire to reach the goal that the inciting incident provoked and nothing's forcing them to make a difficult choice. And that means you don't have a scene, sorry. A mistake is also when the scene turn does not change the character's state. If your character only, say, changes their outfit, black shoes to red shoes, would probably not constitute a meaningful change of state, right? It's a mistake if the character's state changes, but the change is inconsequential to the story. For instance, changing from hungry to fed is not a consequential state change unless the character has been weakened by hunger and life is in the balance. They're starving to death, right? Other mistakes. Having too much exposition, description, explanation, or what we've heard called shoe leather. For instance, if there'd been no obstacles on your way to the Oregon coast, but the story described the entire drive anyway, right? We've all seen this. If you're in a critique group, you've seen that one. That's what we call shoe leather. Basically showing character wearing down their shoes, getting from one place to the next. All right, it's a problem if exposition interrupts action. Typically a writer will interrupt dialogue or action with backstory or internal monologue that explains the situation. Well, these are the writers who are focused on you understanding and all their characters' motivations, choosing the certain actions. You, they want you to understand everything. Find a way to demonstrate why they're making active choices instead, right? If the point of view is muddy or changes mid-scene, you probably have a challenge. Now, there's nothing wrong with having more than one point of view character. Don't, don't get me wrong here. But as a general rule, it's confusing to shift point of view in the midst of a scene. It can be done. I prefer not. Anne thinks that's just fine. It's pick, you know, you, you're going to pick your readers here. But you'd better know if you're going to do it, you better know what you're doing and do it deliberately and with skill. That's a tricky one. And finally, here's a quick note on scenes and chapters. Since the question comes up a lot with our new clients and students, a chapter is a print publishing convention, whereas a scene is inherent to story structure, regardless of the medium. So you have 
chapters in books, but you have scenes, you, sorry, you only have chapters in books, but you have scenes in books, movies, plays, and tales around the campfire in Anne's tale about the ocean. A scene can break across chapters. We see this most often when a writer wants to create a cliffhanger, right? The scene breaks after the turning point. That's how you create a cliffhanger. Um, and a chapter can contain more than one scene. We see this often, you'll see, they'll clearly make a break or they'll, uh, a, a very advanced writer can make a really smooth transition between scenes because they really wanna put together maybe one point of view for a whole chapter or there are different reasons to make those decisions, but a, a chapter can contain more than one scene. All right, so we hope everything we've covered here inspires you to take a look at your own scenes and see if you can find all five essential elements in each one. If you have a question for us, be sure to get that down in the Q&A box below. And while we queue up for that, we'd like to remind you uh, to visit storypath.me slash storypath to get your story free type, excuse me. story types. <laughs> sorry, story types. Storypath.me slash story types to get your free copy of our essential guide to the seven story types. Okay, let's get to your questions. And what are you finding in the in the Q and A for us? Oh, we have some good questions coming into the Q and A here. I'm going to stop share so we can see, everybody can see us here. Um, first, well, let's see here. Are the essential elements of screenplay scenes the same as for novel scenes? I'll take this one because I edit screenplays okay. as well. The screenplay scene in the, like the written format of the screenplay, sometimes you'll have a, like it, it'll change in two words because you've gone from interior to exterior or you're changing shots or something like that. The scene in this, as we define scene, it doesn't have to do with what you're seeing. Like we move from indoors to outdoors necessarily. It is still the thing that contains the five elements. It's a scene in a screenplay has an inciting incident, progressive complications, a turning point, a crisis, a climax, and a resolution, the same as a scene in a novel. It's a little harder to spot because of course in a screenplay, you have basically only dialogue and very small indications of setting and, and so forth. Um, and a lot of what changes in a scene, for example, the crisis decision is going to be up to the actor to put visually on on the screen instead of it being in words in narrative so there's some there's a lot of differences between um, the screenplays and novels but the scene structure is the same in both the essential scene structure uh, let's see sandy euchre Juker says how long is a scene how many paragraphs or is it a chapter we started to answer that question with our distinction between chapter and scene but rochelle do you want to talk about length of scene yeah, so a length of scene can be anywhere from, I've seen them as short as 300 words, I've seen them as long as 3,500 words. Um, it, as, a, as a developmental editor, I've seen them as long as 8,000 words. You do, <laughs> you do, um, generally, 1,500 to 2,500 words, somewhere under 2,000 is a good idea. Um, you it depends on what st what type of story you're writing, where you are in the book, beginning, middle build, end. Uh, generally, you want to shoot for under 2,000 as a good rule, but there isn't a rule for how long um, scenes should be. If you're if you're pushing 3,500, 4,000 on your scenes, though, you're c consider finding a way to break them up or cut exposition, which is you, often, yeah, the case, right, right. often the problem in a 3,500 word scene. If I, if I do get a scene from a client and it's 3,500 words or more, usually yes, it's because um, they have either misunderstood what a scene is and they've combined multiple scenes into one and, and called it a scene or lots of exposition, lots of extra details, um, cut, cut, cut. Great deal depends too on your target audience. For example, the children's book scene that we just mm -hmm. read was what, 150 words? 200 words, something like mm -hmm. that. And it was a complete mm -hmm. scene, very, very mm -hmm. efficiently and brief, uh, a complete scene. Um, several people have asked this question. Uh, for change, this is from Bob Muller. Can you explain more about how to figure out the actual values involved, especially with regard to the main story values? Yeah, um, be sure and download our guide to the seven essential story types because that answer is gonna depend on what kind of story you're telling. Rochelle is like the world's expert on this subject. 
Yeah. So the, so what, so question first is what do you mean by values? Right? So, so you guys might not know what we mean by values here and, and values would be, how does the character change from one state to the other? Or what is the change? They stay, change from this life value to this life value, right? We just call it the change. Um, and like Anne said, depending on the type of story you're telling, we'll tell you which those shifts are. And it's important to note that in a lot of your scenes, in most of your scenes, well, maybe not most, but a lot of your scenes, especially your core scenes, are going to have the same value shift as your global story. So if your global story is about life and death, your scenes better have some life and death challenges in there, right? If you're, if you're, story is about going from ignorance to wisdom, your scenes need to have some major turns in there about going from ignorance to wisdom, naivete to sophistication. Those are, it's really important to get those turns right for your type of story. Doesn't the, mean that a story can't have multiple different changes, right? You don't only have to turn from this value to this value based on your global story. But for the most part, you have a certain range. What were you going to say, Anne? Sorry. Well, in, in, in Coco, it's a story about a, a little boy's relationship to his, his whole family's ancestry. It's, it's what we call a worldview story. Um, and in each consequential scene, he gets either closer to or further from uh, the heart of his family, to his relationship with his family. That's why that scene was so consequential, because it broke his relationship with his family. It turns on values. Sorry, I hit my microphone there. It turns on values of um, family, uh, love and closeness and relationship and a little boy's understanding of what family means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it all depends. The answer to this question is always going to depend on what kind of story, what type of story you're telling. So be sure and get that down. I don't mean to harp on it, but get that down because you will understand more about what we say about the story type if you have a look at our, at our little offering today. A little cheat sheet. A little cheat sheet, yes. Um, Hani Ali Khan, who answered all of the questions, all the crisis questions. <laughs> no, yeah, he doesn't get any answers. <laughs> <laughs> I have planned out a main event for every chapter in my novel. Good, an event. Got to have that. The problem is that I write 2,500 words per chapter. To get to the main event and resolve it, it takes a lot of stalling. Do you have any recommendations for times like these? Um, I, I would say, well, what's stalling? Major? Yeah, are you stalling the inciting incident or st the, um, I would, I mean, I'd have to see these 2,500 words to be more specific, but I would recommend going through, this is actually a pretty good exercise for everybody. Um, take your scene, assuming you write on a computer like most of us do, and go through and highlight in, in a different color uh, text the, um, dialogue and action. Okay. Anytime someone is speaking or doing something, highlight that in like blue. And then if you have explanations, if you have narrative exposition, highlight that in, let's say red, because red is like a warning. If you have 2,500 words and, and you know, 1,500 of them are red, one way you can cut down the length of your chapters is to cut some of that red, right? I'm a little concerned that you are trying to establish that all of your chapters are 2,500 words. That's hypnotic and not in a good way to your reader. You want some longer, some shorter, some quick. Later in the story or at the very climax of the story, they should be shorter. You have permission to be a little longer at the beginning of the story when you're setting things up. Aiming at exact same chapter lengths, even Charles Dickens, who had to publish every week in a serial magazine, got to vary the chapter length a little. If you are not doing that, you are completely free to vary your chapter length, and I would say that you should. I'm, I'm wondering if that's what he means by stalling, if he's padding it out to get to the 2,500 words, maybe. That's, yeah, that's kind yeah. of what I'm, yeah. what I'm guessing here. I'm sorry if we're not getting at, your, at the gist of your question. Um, Anonymous wants to know if there's a chance at getting the slide deck. Yeah, we will provide that. And uh, Haley's going to pass that out to people. Um, number of scenes in a 2,000 word short story or a 4,000 word short story? Number of scenes. That's your call. I've seen a, no I've seen a lot of different things there. Um, Anne brought a story. I can't remember the name of it. It was the war story, Anne, that you mm, had. Wolves that beautiful. Oh, yeah. God, it was beautiful. It had multiple scenes in there that 
pretty quick, I think. My recollection was- It was about 9,000 words. It wasn't super short, ah. but it was a, still a, a short story. Um, at a minimum, you need five. You basically need to have as an inciting incident scene, a scene involving complications. A scene, you basically take the five essentials of scene and, and then it, it, it's a fractal, right? The, you have the five inciting, uh, excuse me, the five essential elements in each scene. And then the global story has to have those five essential elements. I hope that helps. Again, I'd need to know a little bit more about your 2,000 or 4,000 word short story. I, and I'd say the minimum you could probably have is three. Yeah, beginning, That's middle, and end. The, yeah. The, yeah. Because you could combine turning point, crisis, climax, right? You could combine those into one, but you, you, you need some setup. You need some resolution. You need to build it out. You need to flesh it out a little bit. So, Right. Um, it's, it's, Chris is asking what length of scene for middle grade novel? The market is going to dictate the length, the overall length of your middle grade novel. Mm -hmm. um, what is tops? 40,000 words, 30,000 words, something like that, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I would say 50, 50s max, probably. 50s max for a middle grade reader, typically. Um, you know, there's exceptions. And so how you're going to have X number of scenes constitute your beginning, your middle build, which is going to be 50% of the story in your end, the last 25%. Each one of those acts needs to have a few scenes to get, again, to an inciting incident, some setup, an inciting incident, some complications, a turning point. Each act needs a turning point. And so you have, let's say, 40,000 words and you have 15, what, 15, 30, 15 scenes, so 60 mm -hmm. little scenes all in all. Do the math, which I'm incapable of doing on the fly, yeah. and that should give you a rough idea of length of scene for your middle grade right. novel. And I, I'd say typically what I've seen is about somewhere between 20 and 35 ish is the, is the number of scenes that I've, I've seen in middle grade books, but my kids are pick particular books that might not be representative of all the middle grade books here. <laughs> I know what I'm going to say. You're gonna, you're gonna <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Find some of your favorite middle grade books. Find a book that's similar to the one that you want to write. Find five, find three, find two, whatever you're willing to commit to and count. Check it out. What's it look like? What, what are the, the stories that you like the pacing of? The book closest to what you, you want to write. What are the lengths of scenes? What are the lengths of chapters? Overall word count, uh, pacing how much exposition, really take apart two, three to five books that are similar to what you want to be writing. This is, this is something that everybody should do for their type of book, right? Yeah. Don't be afraid of uh, losing your inspiration or feeling unoriginal or, mm -hmm. or losing your sense of mojo because, oh my God, I'm reading other, what other people have written and, they, and this has been done before. Everything's been done before. Use it and, and use it to base some of your decisions on. Read widely, read deeply in your area, read outside your area. I can't stress that enough. It's like the most important thing you could be doing other than actually writing. Uh, Wilfred asks, any differences in humor writing? I have like very little experience with humor writing. Well, I was gonna say, it depends on what you mean by humor because parody would be a whole nother a whole other thing. You're going to make sure all of your scenes are on the money, played up, play played up for intention. They're like we talked about earlier, you may have too many progressive complications. Like this is silly. This is silly. This is silly. Um, and um, for writing humor, I totally recommend Steve Martin's masterclass. I can't, can't, can't say enough about Steve Martin's masterclass. And for uh, masterclass was David Sedaris. Great. Well worth the money if you have it. Great humor storytellers, both of yeah. them. Um, and also, again, if you have a writer that you think is funny, mm -hmm. that you enjoy their humor, like humorous novels, my taste goes way back to like P.G. Woodhouse and stuff. But I mean, check them out. What, how do the scenes work in those novels? What happens. I do know that in, in kind of goofy comedy, you can mount up progressive complications um, mm -hmm. more than you might in a dramatic piece of writing. 
Um, Arsh is asking, is it necessary to add all the elements while writing a scene for a novel's beginning, especially when introducing the characters in the beginning of the book? Yes, is the short answer. <laughs> it's especially important, right? Yeah. Um, if you lead your reader uh, into your story by endless setup without providing any relatively immediate tension, setting some stakes, showing us what this character has to lose, um, you're going to lose your, that this, the, the boring stamp is going to go on that for a lot of readers. So much depends on your, your market, your target audience. If you're in a very literary market, a literary reader will revel in beautiful prose for a certain amount of time, but you still got to give them an event. Um, yeah, so I hope that kind of gets at Right. And, but yes, in general, a scene has all the elements. If it doesn't have all the elements, it's not a scene. And I would say, especially in the beginning, you need to move that faster. You, yeah. you got to hook your reader. And the best way to explain or introduce us to a character is to show them making decisions. Show yeah. things happening to them and then the choices that they make. That's the best way to show us who the character is. And deprive them of something and show us what they do what they that. want yeah what they want yeah, and show them what they want uh honey again hello i have to keep the main event a surprise i add scenes to help wait until the right time to show presumably the scene containing the surprise Rochelle, okay you're shaking your head well i'm shaking my head because i'm not first of all we this is somebody we already know knows his stuff so <laughs> i'm not quite sure i actually have to because you were so quick on that one, I, want, I would want to read that scene and, and tell you what, do you, what are we talking about? Because the way you're describing it may not be the way that I'm hearing it. But I would say anytime you're trying to slow something down and wait for something and you're holding something back, reconsider, really look at that. If you're holding something back from us, we're going to probably feel like you are tricking us cheating us we're not going to trust you as the writer if you're tr if you're holding and holding and holding things back and padding things so that you can get to the event maybe your story is a whole lot longer than you think it needs to be or maybe you're starting too far back or right. um maybe you don't have enough events leading up to the change of the big event right yeah, if you feel like the big event rightly needs to happen at roughly 75% of your story and you're just padding things to get to that, make your story shorter. Make that's, story I mean, shorter. it sounds harsh, but that's probably the approach to take on this. Um, I see, I saw a good question that I want to answer over in the, it got over in the chat box instead. Patricia Hansen is asking, can you explain writing a historical novel? <laughs> I can't explain why yeah, anyone would do that, but I do it. Um, I have a couple things to say about it. One is that you have to decide how historical you're going to be. Yes, your research needs to be good. There's no excuse for bad research in these days of Google and Google Street View and all those kinds of things. Um, but remember that writing a historical novel has a great deal in common with writing a fantasy novel. You are creating a world for the reader, a world that does not currently exist, just as in a fantasy novel. So you get to decide as the author how historical you want the language to be. If you're setting it in a historical period and place where they didn't actually speak the language you're writing in, I mean, it's all made up anyway, right? So you decide where you want to position yourself in the historical novel realm. How realistic do you want to be? I'll just give a quick example. In my novel, set in the early 19th century England, I made a lot of difficult choices about how accurate and Jane Austen-y I wanted the language to be and cut a lot of it because readers really didn't like it. Um, and I personally place a high premium on not using anachronistic words because these characters did speak modern English. Those are choices you make. And I'll tell you what my rule of thumb is. If I imagine myself being, you know, my book is being turned into a miniseries or a movie and I'm going on all the TV shows and someone, this is my worst fear, right? And someone, someone like the host of the TV show finds that one flaw, the thing that I left in there that I just didn't fix and, and attacks me for it and says, how do you explain this? And if I have an, a writerly answer to that question, like I made the conscious decision that that was too complicated for the modern reader or something like that, then I'm satisfied with it. And that should be a good rule of thumb for you too, if you're writing historical. And I'd like to add one more thing that be consistent. It, 
make whatever choice you want within what Ann said. My, my request, <laughs> just be consistent with it. And we'll yeah. buy into whatever world you create. We'll buy into whatever language you set up, the patterns you set up, be consistent. So, yeah. all right. So it is time. We're out of time. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you to everyone because this was yeah, fun. Yeah, thanks. Great group. Great responses. Thank you, everybody. Thank yeah, you thank you much. guys so much for coming. I know there have been a number of people who have asked how you can keep up with Rochelle and Anne. So I'm going to drop again in the chat um, both our upcoming webinars and then the two links at the end will keep you in touch with Rochelle and Anne. So first, there's the link to download the story types. Um, and then the second, pages and platforms let you schedule a free consultation with them. Um, so you can talk more about them, their services, and get all of their awesome help on your books because this was so fantastic. Thank you both so much. Um, um, I think, Rochelle, you're going to come and do a session for us on horror in a little bit. Yes, right? and I'm months. actually I'm actually still trying to, I'm going to think I'm going to rope Anne into coming in with me because oh, we do, I think we do, I think we do well together. So yeah, we're yes. going to do horror in October, how to write a horror story. Awesome. Yeah. So keep an eye out. Definitely sign up for our uh, newsletter and our webinar events so that you guys can see that um, the replay of this will go out as well. Uh, but yeah, Rochelle and Anne will be back <laughs> soon. So thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks everyone Thanks. for staying and have a great rest of your Monday. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye, everybody.